Halloween. Is it just a happy, fun night for kids? Or is it Hell's Holiday? You'll find out on this edition of His Voice Today. Americans spend more money on Halloween than any other holiday throughout the year except for Christmas. Approximately four to five billion dollars are spent on treats, uh, decorations, costumes, party supplies, and the list just goes on and on. Uh, Halloween is definitely a crazy money-making holiday. Just about every neighborhood throughout the country uh, during the Halloween season, if you look at the houses and look at the, the yards, the lawns, you'll see a lot of scary, creepy things. Things like skeletons, ghosts, witches, uh, skulls, tombstones, hands coming out of the ground, RIP for rip, uh, representing when someone dies, spider webs, etc. And all of these things, or at least most of them, are associated with death. Where, where did Halloween come from anyway? If you do an internet search or do your homework on this, uh, there are different opinions, but most are pretty much in agreement that it is an old Celtic holiday that goes way back in history to the British Isles, and it was um, really uh, developed especially by a group of people called the Druids. Now, the Druids were the, uh, the occult priests of many in the, cultic com or the Celtic community, and they were uh, nature worshipers, uh, pagan worshipers, and they worshipped a lot of other things. Uh, the, the Druids believed that the year was divided into two parts, the light part and the dark part. The light part was the part of spring and summer where the seeds were planted and the crops grew and then there was a harvest. It was associated with, uh, with light and growth. And then the dark part of the year, coming at the end of October and then moving on uh, farther into the year, was associated with fall, leaves falling down, and things that were connected to death. Uh, the, the weather got colder, the days got shorter, and uh, life seemed to just fade away. And so what they did was they, uh, they celebrated the transition between the light part and the dark part, especially around the end of October. On October 31, the Druids would have, uh, would have bonfires, special, special ceremonies where they would uh, burn lots of wood and they would also make offerings to what they believed was the Lord of Death, the Lord of Death. Sometimes these offerings were crops, sometimes they were animals, and in rare instances uh, there, are, there are times where they actually offered uh, people as sacrifices, which is obviously uh, one of the most gruesome things that we can imagine. They also believed, the Druids also believed, that on October 31, at the end of the light period as it transitioned into the dark period, that the veil was especially thin between the visible and the invisible world, and that the spirits of the dead were able to break through into the visible world and they, they roamed freely, especially on the night of October 31. As the tr tradition has it, what they believed was that uh, as the spirits would come to people's houses, uh, the people wanted to keep these spirits away because many of, them, many of them they thought were evil spirits. And so they would dress the children especially up in costumes that were scary costumes so that they could try to spook the spirits and scare them away so they wouldn't bother them. They would also put treats uh, and food on their porches so the spirits could take a bite and be happy and then go away uh, and leave everybody alone. The pilgrims, when they came over in the early 1600s from England and Holland, when they crossed the Atlantic, uh, they didn't want anything to do with Halloween. When they founded colonies on American shore, on the American shores, and then eventually when the United States became a nation uh, in 1776, this country took a strong stand against the Druid holiday and they didn't really want anything to do with the darkness associated with this, uh, these festivals and the traditions and the practices that were connected to this, this holiday. 
Uh, eventually, the name was given Halloween, but believe it or not, it was banned in this country until the year 1845. What happened was, uh, in the 1840s, the potato crop failed in Ireland. And so a lot of the Irish decided they wanted to get out of there and they wanted to head over uh, across the sea to America and to try to start a new life. And so many of them landed in New York and they brought their old Celtic Druid holiday with them. And so after 1845, because of the immigration, this holiday was eventually accepted uh, in America and it was accepted also uh, in Mexico. In Mexico, they called it the Day of the Dead. The Day of the Dead. So it's, it's very clear that the, the details connected to Halloween are pretty scary and they have to do with the things of death. Now, uh, is this a holiday that we should be celebrating? What should we do with Halloween? Is it just, a, a, like I said, a happy fun night for kids? Or is it Hell's holiday? Is it connected to things that are sinister and ultimately connected to the dark side, to the evil side, which the Bible talks about, which ultimately is connected to uh, Lucifer or Satan or the devil. Well, let's find out what the Bible says. Let's look at some scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter 18 gives us a list of occult practices that the Israelites were to have nothing to do with when they came out of Egypt and landed in the Promised Land uh, in the time of Moses and Joshua. And this is a very comprehensive chapter that deals with different, different things that are connected to the occult and connected to death. And it's no secret that these are the things that are connected to Halloween. Uh, Halloween is saturated with occultism. It's saturated with things connected to witchcraft, vampires, talking to the dead, and all the things that are really listed in Deuteronomy chapter 18. So let's take a look at some of these verses. Verses 9 to 12, the Bible says, and this was was God talking through Moses to the Israelites right before they entered the promised land. He said, when you have come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. The nations around the Israelites were into all kinds of dark, uh, dark things, wicked things, evil things. And God was telling his people, stay away from these things. I want you to be involved only in good things, not in things that are, are harmful. In verse 10, he said, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or who practices witchcraft or a soothsayer or one who interprets omens or a sorcerer or one who conjures spells or a medium or a spiritist or someone who calls up the dead. And then the next verse says, for all that do these things, are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God will drive these people out from before you. Verse 13 says, you shall be perfect before the Lord your God. So in Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 to 12, God is very clear that things that are connected to the occult, things that are connected to spells and talking to the dead and witchcraft and all of these things, that his people are to have nothing to do with them. He says, when you get into the land, you shall not learn to do these things. Don't even, don't even be involved with them. Don't even, uh, don't even learn them. And some people might think, well, hey, I'm never going to actually do these things, but you know, what's wrong with wearing the costumes of vampires and witches and things that are connected to the occult, just as long as I, I don't do them? Well, the reality is that the people who do do them started out, first of all, learning about them. There's a step-by-step -step process. Uh, you don't get into the darkness overnight. You start slowly, and first you learn, and then you start practicing uh, at least the trappings of the religion or the trappings of these activities, and then before you know it, uh, you're, you're deep and you're involved in doing things that you previously would never imagine that you would have ever done. And so the counsel in the Bible here is very clear. Uh, God is trying to protect his people, and he told the Israelites when they came out of Egypt and went into the land, he said, don't learn about occult practices, don't have anything to do with them, because they are abominations in my sight. That's what God said. And the word abomination is a very strong word. Uh, it actually means those that, uh, it means things that are hateful and that are detestable to God. 
Uh, God does not want his, his children to be involved in anything that is harmful or that is occultic or that is something uh, that is connected to the darkness and the uh, ways of the devil. In, in any way, he wants to protect us from these things and he says, stay away from them. Uh, there's a very instructive section in the book of Mark in the New Testament. Deuteronomy is in the Old Testament. The book of Mark is the second book of the New Testament and in chapter 5 there's an amazing story about a man who was demon-possessed. Mark 5 verses 1 to 3. This is talking about a time when Jesus and his disciples were in a boat. They crossed the Sea of Galilee and they landed on, on the shore, the other side of the shore, into the area of the country of the, let me get to my glasses here and make sure I get the name right, the Gadarenes, the country of the Gadarenes. And verse 2 says that when Jesus came out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. So here's a story in the Bible about a person that was uh, possessed, who was possessed by by the devil and by demons, by many demons. Uh, we know this because later on, Jesus looked at this madman, this crazy man, and he said, what's your name? And out of this man's mouth came this uh, deep voice, and he said, my name is Legion, for we are many. So there were many, many demons inside this man. And he was a crazy man. He, he had practically lost his mind. Uh, and the Bible tells us that he was very strong because the demons were inside of him. He was able to break his chains. They had, people had tried to bind him in the community and they couldn't. He was just a, he was a crazy, mad terrorist. Uh, and we know that there were lots of demons in him, that this wasn't just, uh, he didn't just have psychological problems because when Jesus finally drove the demons out, there were uh, thousands of them. A, le a Roman legion is somewhere between three and 5,000 troops. And he said, my name is Legion, we are many. And all these demons went out of this man and they went into, into a herd of pig, the pigs that were grazing on the hillside. And the Bible says that this herd of pigs rushed down the hill and they, they jumped into the water and they drowned in the sea. And so it's obvious that this man was not just dealing with uh, some kind of psychological problem, that he, had, he was possessed by real evil spirits. The point that I want to make here is that uh, when this man was fully possessed and the devils had full control of his life, they drove him to live in a cemetery, to live among tombs. In other words, when Satan takes control of a person's life, he moves him into the things of death, the things of darkness, the things that have to do with cemeteries and bones and the things that are, that are very scary and that are actually the same things that are connected to Halloween. And to me, this is very uh, enlightening that when the devil takes control, he moves a person toward death and the things of the grave. And that's what happened in Mark chapter 5. But the good news is that uh, Jesus didn't leave this poor man in that condition, but he, he worked a miracle that only God can do. Jesus looked at that man who was trying to talk, but he couldn't, only devils were talking from his mouth, and he looked at him and he said, come out, you unclean spirit. And he drove these demons out, they went into the pigs, the pigs died. And then the Bible tells us what happened to this man when he was transformed by the power of the Lord. In verse 15, the Bible says that the people from the community came out to see what was going on, and it says they came to Jesus and they saw him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion, and he was sitting, and he was clothed, and he was in his right mind. So Jesus delivered this man, and uh, he put his clothes back on. Uh, intelligence and illumination came to his mind. The devils were gone. The Holy Spirit was inside. His facial expression completely changed, and he had this look of peace and love and joy uh, inside of him. So he went from madman to uh, happy, content, peaceful, uh, a happy, content, and peaceful follower of Jesus Christ. And Jesus ripped him out of the state that he was in, and I can guarantee you that after he was delivered from the devil and from the legion, he didn't, he didn't continue to live uh, in the cemetery. That's for sure. There's another Bible verse in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. 
that is also extremely instructive. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 gives us some more insight into Jesus and the devil and the things that the devil is connected to. Hebrews 2 verse 14 talks about Jesus Christ and what he has the power to do. The Bible says that through death, through his own death, he entered, Jesus entered the world of death. He came down here uh, as a pure and holy savior. He came from a world of light. Up in heaven, there's no tombstones. There's no vampires. There's no witches up there. There's no uh, spider webs and, and rip signs and all the things that are connected to the darkness. There's no graves. There's nothing that has to do with the occult. None of that is up there. And Jesus came down here from a pure, holy, happy heaven. He was born in Bethlehem. He lived a perfect life for you and for me. He didn't have anything to do with the darkness. He walked in the light of his Father's love. And at the end of that life, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he made a, a very uh, momentous decision. And that decision was to take our sins, to take your sins, to take my sins, to take the, the sins of the world, the darkness of the world, the wickedness of the world. And he took all these things into his mind and into his heart. And then he suffered. He suffered for our sins. And he ultimately died on a cross for you and for me. And Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 tells us what he accomplished by his death. Verse 14 says, that he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Let me read that again. That he might destroy him that has the power of death, that is, the devil. The devil is, is the one that has the power of death. The devil is the one that's connected to death and the things of death. And Jesus Christ came down here to destroy him, and he did it. He destroyed him through his suffering, through his own death, because he entered the domain of death, and then he rose from the dead. Uh, in John chapter, I believe it's chapter 11, verse 25, going by memory, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He conquered death, he conquered hell, he conquered the devil, he conquered the things of darkness when he came out of the tomb, never to die again. There are other verses that speak to, to my heart and hopefully to your heart concerning Halloween and, th and the things connected to Halloween. Acts chapter 26, verse 18, we find Jesus turning the, uh, the life of a man named Saul around. He changed his name to Paul, and then he called him to go out and preach the gospel, to preach the good news of his love and his power and his grace. And in verse 18, Acts 26, verse 18, the Bible says that Jesus sent Paul to open their eyes, to open people's eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So this, this verse tells us that we're in a battle between two sides, between God and the devil. And we know that the devil has the power of death. The devil is, uh, he's the author of death. He's the author of sin. He's the author of darkness. He's the author of evil. And Jesus conquered him. He conquered him through his death, burial, and his resurrection. And then he told Paul after his resurrection that I want you to go out and to open people's eyes, to help them to see that we're in a battle between two sides, to turn them from the darkness to the light and from the power of Satan to God. So according to this inspired Bible verse, God wants us to, to make a transition from the things of the dark to the things of the light. He wants us to come out of the things that have to do with Satan, and he wants us to come to the power of God. He wants us to have nothing to do with the power of the devil, the power of the enemy. He wants us only to have to do, only to be involved with the things of his power, his love, his goodness, the things that lead to heaven that don't lead us into darkness and sin and death. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 is another verse, and then I'll share one more after this. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul makes it very clear how Christians should relate to the things of darkness. Should we, should we join these things? Should we mix with them? Should we call the things of, uh, of evil fun? Which is basically what Halloween does. Halloween takes the things of death, the things of the devil, the things of the occult, the things of witchcraft and vampirism, all the things that God says don't have any, anything to do with them, and, and what, what Halloween does today is it makes those things fun and, and happy and cool for kids. Uh, it 
Doesn't that sound to you like a, a strategy of the enemy to get Christians or to get people, anyone, to slowly get involved with the things of darkness? That's what's happening. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, Paul gives us very clear counsel about how we should relate to the things of darkness. Verse 11, Paul says that we are to have no fellowship, no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather we should expose them said, don't, don't hang around with these things. Don't have fellowship with them. Don't get involved with them. Instead, we should, uh, we should blow the whistle. We should expose them. Now, some people might think, wow, Steve, you know, you're really, uh, you're really taking a, a conservative, conservative hardline approach to this subject. But all I'm trying to do is follow what the Bible says. I'm not trying to be hard-nosed. I just know that Halloween is connected to the things of death, the things of darkness, that the Bible says are connected to the devil. And Jesus says, Stay away from these things. And Paul says, expose them. Don't be involved with them. So by the grace of God, that's what we are trying to do here at Whitehorse Media on this program, His Voice Today. We are trying to expose the things that have to do with darkness and the devil because that's exactly what the Bible says that we should be doing. So um, what about the kids? What about the children? Should we just you know, completely avoid the holiday and, and don't have any anything to do with it at all or don't have any wholesome alternatives for the kids. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a dad. Uh, my wife's name is Kristen. My son's name is Seth. He's eight years old and my daughter is Abby, Abigail Rose Wahlberg. And, and what we do, and we've been involved with different churches throughout the years uh, as we've traveled and as we've moved from place to place. Uh, and, and many times the churches that we've been involved in, what they do as an alternative to Halloween uh, is they, they have what they call fall festivals. And we actually did this uh, not too long ago in our, in our barn. We live in uh, Priest River, Idaho. We have a pretty good-sized barn. And so right on the night of Halloween, uh, we had a fall festival. And we had our kids there, and we had neighborhood kids, and we had uh, church friends. And instead of doing the things of darkness, we had, uh, we had a campfire. We had a hayride. And a lot of churches and different groups will do this. They'll have positive things. We had uh, bobbing for apples. Uh, we'll tell simple Bible stories for the kids. And we just have a wholesome, happy, uh, heavenly time where we're trying to provide something positive for our kids. So I'm not saying that you should do nothing for your children. You know, kids need to keep busy. They've got to be doing something. And during this time of year, it's a good time to provide a wholesome, happy alternative for children where we're not taking the things of evil and making them fun. Something else that has become a tradition in our home, uh, we have kids knocking on our doors and you know, neighborhood kids will come, may come to your door and they're looking for a treat. So what we do is we, we consider that night to be a night of trick or tracking. And what I mean by that is when the kids come to your door and knock and they have their pillowcases and whatever they've got uh, looking for a treat, we can give them uh, something, and we can also give them a track. We give them a little Bible track. There's lots of tracks that are out there. The American uh, Track Society has tracks. Whitehorse Media has tracks. Uh, these are just little, little pieces of paper with Bible verses, a Bible story, uh, something that can, can shed the light of God's voice into the minds of young people who are not thinking generally about God or the Bible or heaven at all. They're just out to have a good time, and I understand that. And so when they come and knock on your door, you can hand them a track. And you never know. You might see someone in heaven. You might have a friend throughout all eternity because on a Halloween night, on a night of darkness that, that is connected to all the things of evil and the things of the devil, uh, you can give them a track and put a word of God, the word of God in their hearts and minds and show them the love of Jesus and the power of Jesus and that Jesus conquered death he rose from the dead, he went to heaven, and someday soon he's going to come back for his children, for those who love him, for those that are separated from the things of darkness, and those that uh, are ready for his return so they can live with him forever and ever and ever in a beautiful place called heaven and eventually in what the Bible calls the new earth. They can live in the new Jerusalem and they can have a happy eternity where there, there will be no more death, 
no more sorrow, no more sin, no more suffering. Uh, and I can guarantee you, in the new earth, uh, there won't be a Halloween and there won't be houses and landscapes that are connected to, uh, that have witches and, and uh, spider webs and skeletons and hands coming out of the ground and all the things that are connected to evil and to the things of darkness. Last verse, John chapter 8, verse 12. In John 8, Jesus made a huge contrast between the things of darkness and the things of light, and he put himself in the middle of the light. In John chapter 8, verse 12, the Bible says that Jesus spoke to them again, and he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Basically, Halloween as a holiday is connected to very evil things, uh, dark things. I used to have a, a friend of mine that got out of witchcraft, and she tells the story of all the uh, scary things that happen on Halloween that are very, very evil. And, but she got out of all that by the grace of God, and she is now a follower of Jesus Christ. And Jesus tells us that he wants us to follow him. And if we do, we will not walk in darkness. We'll have nothing to do with darkness. But Jesus says that we will have the light of life. I am the light of the world, Jesus said. Let's follow him and have nothing to do with darkness. You have just heard his voice today.